your fountain of youth? Circadian Rejuvenation Med Spa is Charlotte's luxurious one-stop med spa. We offer microneedling, hydra and laser facials, laser hair, scar, and vein removal, cryo skin treatments, medical weight loss solutions, and much more. Visit us online today at circadianrejuvenation.com and give yourself the gift of looking and feeling your best. Book your free consultation today at Circadian Rejuvenation Med Spa. It's not just a service. Uh, I'm not rehearsed. All right. Um, guys, thank you for visiting my channel today. Um, I have um, none other than Sugar Sean Ray, um, Hall of Fame bodybuilder, one of the bodies that growing up, man, I part of my French, I fucking idolized. <laughs> thank uh, you, Rich. Should have should have definitely won a couple of um, a, a couple of Olympias, but you know what? The, this is this is a very politically driven world, but um, but definitely a body um, to admire. Probably the only other person that I could say had a better body is Frank Zane. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's a subjective sport of opinion. Yeah. I love Frank. Yeah, it's a, Frank it was an amazing guy. So um, first and foremost, thank you for um, for for, um, for coming on. Um, for those that don't know, um, Sean and I, um, like, you know, Sean and I were very, very close uh, throughout the WFN and the Iron Attic days. Um, you've helped me out dramatically in introducing me to all the right people in the bodybuilding industry and the powerlifting industry. As you, um, um, as people know, you being a spokesperson in a lot of these shows, specifically in the Arnold Classics and the Olympia. Um, so let's let's go. You know, let's go straight at it, man. Um, you've right. had an amazing career, and you continue to still have an amazing career and be socially relevant, which is which is unheard of in with bodybuilders of your era. So what have you learned that you can, um, that you can provide to bodybuilders now or aspiring bodybuilders to give them at least some insight on how to have a long and promising career like you have? You really have to love what you do, Rich. I mean, I didn't get in this for longevity. I got in it because it was my passion. And then uh, when I was old enough to recognize that I was good at it, I found a way to monetize it, make it a business. So who doesn't want to get up and go to work doing something they love? Um, I think that the old saying says, if you find something you love doing, you'll never work a day in your life. And I really truly believe that my labor of love has brought me to this end. I started at 17 years old. I'll be 57 this September. So I don't know how many years that is, but I mean, um, you know, it's the only thing I've ever known. And, uh, you know, I came up in the Mike Tyson era. I've always given Mike his props. We came up parallel, two different careers. But I learned by watching and studying this guy that, you know, you really have to practice like you play. And when I started practicing bodybuilding as a teenager, uh, the gym was no play. It wasn't a playground. It wasn't some place I went to play. I went to work. I wanted to be the best. I was bitten by the bug early. John Brown was a two-time Mr. Universe, three-time Mr. World. Uh, he was my customato, like Mike Tyson had in boxing. Mike, uh, John Brown told me that I would be Teenage Mr. America when I first started the bodybuilding. He told me that I would be a uh, professional, and he told me that one day I could possibly be Mr. Olympia. And to hear those things as a teenager um, from somebody that had such a colorful career and who was known for his dynamic posing style, and in my first bodybuilding show, I was best poser. And then I went on to win many best poser awards. Uh, I, bought, I bought into the dream. I bought into the idea that I could be one of the best. So I practiced like I played. I played hard. Uh, I didn't go to the gym to train. I, I went to the gym to win. I found training partners that I could beat up on, not people that I could have fun with. So my mentality as a teenager was different than a, a, another teenage bodybuilder. They, they just didn't stand a chance. And uh, I, I studied the bodybuilding game. I became a historian. I learned about Peter McGough. I learned about Wayne, uh, Wayne D'Amelio, Rick Wayne, uh, Jim Mannion, Joe Weider, and all the people that were covering, promoting, marketing the sport of bodybuilding. I learned what it was like to promote a show, commentate on a show, work on a television bodybuilding show, deal with sponsors, travel the world as an ambassador for companies, and also compete at the highest level. So when my career was over, I didn't have to go looking for something to be relevant. I didn't have to go looking for something to, to keep my, continue my passion. I just continued to expand on what I learned. And, and, you know, to get to where I've gone, you have to reach back and lift some people up. 
uh, you know, I, I drug along with me Melvin Anthony and Richard Jones and Dennis Newman and and uh, some of the other bodybuilders, Troy Zuccolato. I, I drug them along with me on my journey. And in retirement, you know, I, I created Sean Ray Classics. And Phil Heath was my first winner of his first pro show. Kai Green won his first Sean Ray Classic in 2007. I uh, started creating some Best Poser Awards, started promoting shows in Baltimore and New York and all the way over in Hawaii. I'm on my fifth year there. So bodybuilding has been very good to me in the sense that um, I, I've always loved every aspect of it. And in retirement, I've come to have a better appreciation for it, better respect af- athletically. I, I no longer train. I exercise. Um, I'm more interested in health and longevity than I am what I look like. Uh, but my passion is just as strong on a global scale, traveling the world still over in Switzerland and Japan and in China and Germany and Peru and Chile. So I'm, I'm just as involved now as I ever was. I raise money for the Mr. Olympia. I'm an editor in chief of a website for bodybuilding. I cover shows. I interview the up and coming guys. And of course I take the shots. I mean, the squeaky wheel doesn't always get the oil, but I call things like I see them. So I'm going to have people that like me. I'm going to have people that hate me. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, I'm only still here because I keep it honest and I tell the truth. Yeah, which is which is good because that's a lot like me. Um, I, you know, in every industry that I was in, I was always transparent, no nonsense. You know, hence the reasons why um, to segue into this is like I look back in my um, in the WFN days and how I saw all these people scatter like flies, saying, "Oh, well, you know, I've been bamboozled and all that other stuff." It's like I, I look at it from the standpoint, I was like, "Man, screw you, man!" I was like one of the most transparent people you can imagine. Yeah. People knew. I mean, I yeah. can understand the whole aspect of uh, separating yourself and in, in hopes of not being looked at. But, you know, to say that I misled you, that I was conniving, that I was this and all that other stuff. It's like, you know, it's like it's just straight nonsense. I mean, I've heard it's crazy you said that because I remember when I was looking up to individuals on who to bring on board as role models and who to bring on board as spokespeople, people to help my clinic thrive. And everyone was like, oh, Sean Ray was going to be horrible. Kevin LeBron is going to be horrible to work with. And mind you, is that you guys are probably the most easygoing people to deal with. I mean, like it, it, it was it was plain. It was plain simple. I told you, like, hey, I need to get into this show. I need to do this. I need to do that. You deliver. Right. <laughs> You're right. making the excuses. Whereas like some individuals, man, it's like I was paying them a handsome amount of money and they didn't even want to do a post. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Listen, at the end of the day, all you have is your word. I understood that at a very young age, uh, being punctual, being timely, being responsive. Those are all things about, uh, you know, being a professional. I was, I was college educated, but I also knew that in this industry, timing is everything, especially if someone's writing you a check. Um, I work for my money. I don't want handouts. I think the more I'm able to produce, the longer I'm able to have these relationships. And so I get complaints from athletes. I hear it all the time. Like, why are you still getting contracts? Why are people still sponsoring you? Why are still people still working with you? Uh, There's the art of negotiation. And then there's the art of delivering. I I deliver on the things that I say that I do. I'm a a global uh, asset in the sense that my bodybuilding career took me around the world. I've got a big portfolio, an excellent network. But all I have is my reputation as a businessman. When I hear my athletes and colleagues and contemporaries complain about me sean ray's all about sean ray of course i'm all about sean ray who uh, like i don't owe anybody anything this is an individual sport so if i'm able to share whatever wealth i'm able to generate then that's a that's a side bonus but i have no obligation to reach back and help any bodybuilder but i do know in my heart of hearts that the more people i'm able to help the longer i'm going to be able to be in this industry so i get that aspect so I welcome guys that like to talk shit and like to hate on me because they typically don't know me. They're watching from the cheap seats and they really want to be me and they can't. So you have to have very thick skin in this industry to continue to thrive. And and you're going to have to take the shots. You're going to have to understand that not everyone's going to be happy for you when you're succeeding. So I just love to continue to excel. It drives the haters nuts. Uh, They become more available and more visible with social media. So I know who my haters are. And part of my success is just watching them fail. And, and so that's, what, that's the climate we live in. In the old days, we had only the magazine. So we were, we, as athletes, we were sheltered from the criticism. And now we're able to see the criticism. And uh, you'll find that the successful athletes out there, the successful people in the world, uh, 
they hear the criticism and then we turn up the heat and we take it to another level. I love it every time I lock the, lock in a deal or do a promotion because I know my haters are going to run to the internet and talk all of their shit. And I'm going to sit back and enjoy my coffee or my glass of wine and watch them squirm. I, that's the aspect of the sport that I love. Talk well, more shit. Talk more shit. I work even harder. But it, but it, but it's I, I think that the reasons for that is because um, one of the things that I've always admired from you is that you have a a, a phenomenal business acumen. See, a lot of people don't um, don't um, don't treat their career as a business, especially bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is so short lived. You have people even before their prime passing away because of you know because of drugs, because of, of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. To, to see somebody still be socially relevant, still growing, still thriving in this industry like yourself, you know, it's like, it gives, you know, it, it shows people that's like, hey, you know what? It's possible if you have the right succession plan to still generate money in this industry. However, um, you have to understand that, you know, it's like the competition side of it is very short lived. I mean, there's very few people like, like, like when I convinced um, Kevin Lerone, you know, at, at 52 years of age to get back on the Olympia stage, when and, and, um, it was a highlight for me, man, because I looked up to the I looked up to the guy, man, and it's like, and I was able to get him in there, go toe to toe with Cedric, go toe to toe, you know, God bless Cedric, man, uh, rest in peace, um, and and go toe to toe with some, you know, with some of these guys, and 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 they're looking at him like, man, it's like. Um, how how much you how long you trained to get here? I was like, oh, a few months. <laughs> yeah, but that's how he trained his whole career. It was only a few months out of the year. It, it served him well. He found a, a, he found a formula that worked for him. I was one of the detractors. I was the guy telling him that he couldn't do it, and he needed that from somebody that was close to him. He needed that from someone he respected. That all these people were blowing smoke up his butt about how great he was going to be. He needed to hear somebody grab on his ankle and go, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. So it drove him even further to actually do it. So I was one of the guys that were going, Kevin, you're going to hurt yourself. Kevin, you can't win. Kevin, don't even try it. Don't even leave it alone. You got a family. You got, you know, you're old. And I knew my role in Kevin's comeback. And thank God when it was all said and done, we were able to shake hands and become friends again. But I really was his, uh, I was the, the Mr. T in the Rocky movie against Rocky, right? Mr. T was like, you, your has been fool. You can't do that. Yeah. I'll, take, I'll take your girl and I'll take your money. I was that for Kevin Lavroni. So it was good to see him actually do that comeback and come out on the other end. Yeah. It's so funny because I followed up uh, because during that time I wasn't incarcerated. So I, I was following, I was following your, you know, like your, your, um, quote unquote shit talking. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I understood the method to your madness. So, and I was yeah, telling him, I was like, look, it's like, you needed that, you needed that drive. And I've yeah. always told him, I was like, because God bless him, man. He's a phenomenal guy, but um, he's also stubborn sometimes. And I remember, I, I remember that I kept, you know, it's like, um, I told him, I was like, yo, dude, you got to build up your legs. You got to build up your legs. You got tendonitis. If you attend the let's do PRP treatments. I do more advanced treatments to help in getting your legs at least up to par. Because this is a dude that at 52 years old, you saw his upper body. And, 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 oh, yeah. You know, no. I, and here's the thing. He like crazy. Well, he, he knew his strengths. But the weakness is father time. No one can beat father time. So since I knew he wasn't going to quit and I knew he was going to go through it all the way, I had to make sure that he knew that I felt he was going to quit, that he would back out, that he would not, he would let everybody down. I was as a, I, and people didn't understand that because, you know, they're like, isn't Sean supposed to be friends with Kevin? But I knew my role in all of that run up to that show that if I, if I become a fan, if I become an attaboy type of a person, Kevin has no one that he respects that's telling he cannot do it. I had to stay the course. And Kevin and I are fine. We went right back to being friends when the whole thing was over. But he had a lot of struggles and a lot of challenges. And, of course, Father Time wins every time. And for Kevin, it was the legs. The legs were a big issue. Yeah. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was gratifying for me to see that he didn't quit because that – that was me with John Brown. John Brown made me quit as a teenager bodybuilding many times. And I know what quitting feels like. If Kevin had to pull out of that Olympia, he'd be kicking himself today. He'd probably be an alcoholic, right? Like when you can't finish something that you put your heart and soul into it, sometimes you just never recover. Bertle Fox was that way after he got beat at the 83 Mr. Olympia. Um, so for Kevin to actually go all the way through it and, and actually see the contest through, that was the victory that Kevin needed in order to be comfortable with his own inner self, 
and now he's doing great with his supplement line. And again, you can't stay in this business this long if you don't love what you do. And for Kevin, he had unfinished business. He was injured. He didn't go out the way he wanted to, so he had to make the comeback. And I knew my role as a villain. I had to stay true to myself and tell him he cannot do it. He's going to quit. All the way up to the press conference, I said, I know something's going to happen tomorrow, and you're not going to be up on the stage. And it was it was the perfect kind of yin and the yang that Kevin needed to finish the actual show. People yeah. didn't understand that aspect, though. Well, of course, but it's because it's because you got the trolls, you got the people that are ignorant, that don't know anything about the industry, don't know the back, you know, the back end of things. Um, so, right. um, but you know, me being actively involved in the industry at that point in time, it's like I knew, I knew the method to your madness. <laughs> yes. Well, Kevin knew I had love for him. I mean, it was, I think it was good social media fodder. His, his, I think his social media went up like by five hundred thousand on that comeback. Oh, that comeback, dude! I, I, I had my, for my clinic, it was. It was the peak. I was doing yeah. about twenty twenty five thousand dollars in sales a day. Him announcing his comeback, I went from having a payroll of over thirty five thousand a month in sponsored athletes to only having him, and just his comeback got me to breaking almost damn near forty five thousand dollars in sales a day. Just his yeah, comeback from nice. one person. When I, when in actuality, if you remember when I first had you on board, I had like what like nine ten athletes. Right. I had the little bridges. I had you. I had, <laughs> I had everybody. <laughs> yeah. In the I know. Industry. Um, Good times. Yeah, he did, he did. He did great. So one of the things in which, in which I want to highlight is that not only have you done a phenomenal job in transitioning your career and continuing being socially relevant, but for, for, but for a lot of people that don't know, um, it's, you know, it's like you have also a very successful daughter. Um, she, you know, she, she originally started out, um, in a dancing competition, you right. know, I remember, I remember watching it. Um, and she now grew to, to being a 1.7 million uh, follower on Instagram, a 500,000 YouTube, uh, YouTube subscribing, very successful singing, acting, um, career. Uh, yeah. I mean, to be pretty, uh, to be brutally honest, I was like, I like, like a lot more famous than you. <laughs> yeah, well, here's the thing. And, I, and, I, and I, I say this all the time before I even had kids. Um, if you can find your passion young, um, you'll get there a lot faster. Like, you know, kids sometimes, they don't really know what they want to be in life. They don't know what they really want to do in life. And sometimes it takes place after college because you have all this education and then you figure it out and then you're 20 something years old and then you go on into your career. Listen, if you know you want, like Mike Tyson, if you know at 15 years old that you want to one day be the heavyweight champion of the world and you put everything into it. I mean, he got there after five years. He was the youngest champion at 20 years old. Yeah. I started lifting weights and bodybuilding at 17 years old. And I was being told that I could be the teenage Mr. Uh, teenage Mr. America. Well, I was that in two years. And in three years, I was a professional bodybuilder. And th in three, four years, I was on the Mr. Olympia stage. I graduated high school in 1984. 1988, I was standing on that Olympia stage looking at my future. So for my daughter being involved in dance, she was a national dance champion at the age of five. She got picked up on a television show called Abby's Ultimate Dance Competition at the age of six. Then she went on Dance Moms at seven. And then by eight years old, she had her own show called Raising Asia. It's all on YouTube. Yeah. And then from, from Raising Asia, she decided she wanted to become a singer. So then she started dropping music on YouTube. She, she got her own little Spotify music list and, and she cut an, uh, an album and she's collaborated with other artists. She sang with Mariah Carey during her Christmas special in New York at Beacon Theater where I made my pro debut in 1988. How yeah, I saw that. that, I saw that. So I, 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 I don't take credit for her success. She self-made, her mom helps manage her career, but she knew that she wanted to go that route. And at 16 years old, she'll be 17 next month. She figured it out what she wants to do. She wants to be in the entertainment. She dances, she sings, and she acts. And now she's doing some modeling. So I highly support a parent that supports a child that has passion. If you know you want to be in the military and you, you're in high school, you go in the ROTC and you go into, straight into the military, guess what? By the time you're 38 years old, you could be a 20-year military veteran with a pension at 38 years old. You know, if the teenager figures it out in high school, that that's what they want to do with their career. I figured out in high school that I wanted to be Mr. Olympia. 
and it, before I was done, I was on that stage 13 times, 12 top five finishes, two second place runner ups. I mean, I was very close to realizing my dream, but I was living the dream through the journey. And that's how my daughter started out. She started out way younger than I did. She was five years old, you know, and, doing yeah, this and, stuff. And what's crazy that you say that because uh, I, I now, um, my son, what evolved to at the tender age of two or three years old, forcing him to dance to Rick James Super Freak on top of the hey. kitchen table, um, knowing that I have no freaking rhythm whatsoever to like right. having a, a TikTok profile. And this dude, this dude dances. I'm talking about like he dances. Like I have, I have friends in Beverly Hills. I have like celebrities telling me like, man, we need to like, we need to like really like, you know, like blow him up. It's like, I, can, I, I understand the whole passion aspect of I, my ex-wife, you know, you know, God bless her. She's like, oh, well, he's not concentrating in school. He's not involved in sports. He's not involved in this. And I'm like, man, why don't you just be shut up and look at the actual yeah. passion that he has. I mean, at the age of 16, I opened up and launched my first business because at the age of 16, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to have my own businesses, not work for anybody else. You know why? Because I hate taking orders. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, uh, but I knew, I, I knew what I wanted and I never deviated from it. And every single day, I, um, since I've been released June 7th, I invest at least minimally about an hour and a half being his TikTok dancing choreographer. Okay. <laughs> I'm on, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm on fitness. Like I'm on FaceTime telling his, like, you know, like telling him the certain moves to do and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and managing his profile now. Why? Because, I see the I see the energy and the passion that he has for it. So I want to show him that as as his father, just like you have, you know, with your yeah. daughter, that he has my hundred percent support. That's all. They, that's all you need to do as a parent. I mean, exposure is key. The passion has to come from within. You can't force someone to dance. You can't force someone to sing. You can't force someone to be a bodybuilder. This all comes from within. No one was cooking my meals. No one was driving me to the gym. No one was forcing me to train when I was sore or, you know, going to the gym when it's raining. I mean, all of these things come from inside. And uh, although I never saw the finish line as a teenager, exposure was key. You know, yeah. exposure. I, I read every book. I read every magazine. I watched every video. I went to every show that I could go to. But no one forced me to do it. They just gave me the exposure to it. My, I, my passion led me into learning how a bodybuilding show is run inside and out as a promoter. I didn't know that in life after bodybuilding that that's what I would become, a promoter, um, a commentator. I was commentating shows while I was actually a competitive bodybuilder. That set me up for being able to travel the world and commentate on bodybuilding shows. Uh, and so this is what I've been doing for the last 30 years of my life. So yeah, my passion is able to sustain a lifestyle that I've become accustomed to, but my sweat equity in the gym of the pursuit of trying to become number one um, is what led me to this end. You don't have to be number one. There's only one person in the world that's going to be Mr. Olympia. Everyone else is a loser. Now, what are you going to do with that mentally, right? There can only be only one Mr. Olympia. And I understood that very clearly. So I needed to make sure when Mr. Olympia contest was over that me, Sean Ray, as a package, I need to walk and carry my head high and market myself as Mr. Olympia because not everybody can be 5'10 and 300 pounds. Not everyone is in agreement that Mr. Olympia is the best in the world. So I catered to my audience. My audience were guys my height. My audience were guys that didn't like the opposite of me, which was mass and huge. And So I knew in Italy, I knew in Spain, I knew in Mexico, I knew in Japan that the smaller end was very popular in Brazil. So I, I focused on those areas the way that Lila Brada did. That's where the people loved us. But in the meantime, well, there can only be only one winner. I carried myself as if I won the contest. I didn't look at myself as a loser. I never felt it like a loser. I, and, and when you compete against the best in the world, any one of us in the top six could win that show throughout the 90s. That's why when they started talking about the Hall of Fame, all you have to do is to validate how good you are is look at the guys that you beat and look at the guys that were beating you. And all the guys I was coming up with in the 90s are pretty much Hall of Fame guys in the top six. Yeah, Ronnie. Yeah. Vince Taylor, Ronnie Coleman, uh, these guys, flex, I can go, the list is on. Uh, yeah. And I had a taste of Dorian, Lee Haney, and Ronnie Coleman, three of the, the greatest Mr. Olympias with 22 Olympia titles between them. And there I was standing up there uh, in the tops with them. So 
my career on as a competitor was a lot shorter than my career as a retired athlete. So I'm finding ways to stay involved with my passion by watching other people do what I used to do. Um, to say, I, th- you know, thanks for that. You know, thanks for that highlight. Um, to segue um, into something um, into something more fun, um, you've actively been involved in the industry, and you um, obviously in the social media world, um, seeing all this news about um, people portraying themselves as being all natural, you know, aka fake natties. Um, some of the individuals with the most amazing physiques. Um, person like Liverhead saying he has ab implants and does ten micro workouts a day, and he's all natural. I mean. What is your take on the industry, uh, especially like, you know, a person like Liver King, a person like Sadiq claiming he's an all-time natural? I mean, it's like, what, what is your take, uh, you know, uh, about, uh, about this and this whole fake natty craze? So as a fan, I've never been interested in what the athletes take to look the way they do. Um, I, it's almost, it's an art show to me, right? So to me, I'm looking for the physiques that I like. Um, and of course there's physiques I don't like when I go into a restaurant and I look at the menu, I'm going to order things that attract my interest. And I don't really pay attention to the octopus or the snails or the, or the other items on the menu that I'm not interested in. I'm got, my eyes are going to gravitate to the things that I like as a bodybuilder. When I go and watch a show, I'm looking at the physiques and paying attention to the physiques. I like, I'm not looking at how they got to that end. I'm looking at the finished product, and that's what's being judged on stage. I don't care if a guy drinks 10 cups of coffee, takes 10 IUs of growth hormone, uh, is on speed or on cocaine. I don't really care. It's, an art, it's a visual eye candy stimulation. So I'm not interested. When you listen to music, do you know that, like, Jimi Hendrix was a drug addict? Do you know that Michael Jackson was a drug addict? Do you know that Prince was a drug addict? I'm not thinking about all the drugs that the Rolling Stones took when they make, you know, I can't get no satisfaction. That's my jam, right? Yeah. So I'm listening, I'm listening to the lyrics. I'm listening to the drums. I'm listening to the music. I'm digging the beat. I don't care if Keith Richards is a drug addict or Mick Jagger's snorting cocaine. These are individuals that have flaws. They, they have character issues. And I'm only looking at the finished product, which is basically a glorified art show. So. I don't care how they got there individually. What I care about when I go and pay my money to watch a physique show is what am I looking at? And I'm really never letting my mind take me to how did they get there? I mean, when you watch these guys in race cars, they have a thing called Adderall out there. A lot of these race car drivers take Adderall for, to stay alert. Um, yeah, for, fo- for focus. I mean, my son takes it, and I used to take it at one point in time for attention deficit. But, but for, yeah, but for me as a fan, I, I don't. What do I, I'm, I'm watching a car race, right? I'm fucking 100, 200 laps. Let's see who wins. I don't, I've never gotten caught up, Richard, in what someone has to take or what they do behind closed doors because what works for you might kill me. And me knowing what you're taking does nothing for me to understand why you look the way you look. I'm going to watch the finished product. I'm not looking at the hours that you sacrifice and the food and the calories and the, the bulking up and the dieting down and the cardio. All of that is out the window. When I pay for my ticket and I walk in that room, I'm there to be entertained. I'm there to look at the finished product. I'm not investing my mind in how did you do it? So it's not a magic act. Like in a magic act, you're always trying to figure out how the magician did the trick that you can't really understand. The idea for the magician is to do the sleight of hand so it's seamless. and It leaves you shocked and amazed. You leave there Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how they did those magic tricks. When I walk to a bodybuilding show, I've never walked away. And go, how did they do that? I've never, I've walked away with a greater appreciation for what they've accomplished, but I don't try to figure out what they have to do in terms of what they're taking, drinking, or sacrificing to get there. I just want to be entertained. I want to be, I want to enjoy the experience. And all these busybodies who are, who are curious, is this guy natural? Is this guy on growth? Is this guy on insulin? It almost sounds like you just, you're, you're being too busy. You're being nosy. Uh, it's their business, but I've never got sucked into that, Richard. Um, people have asked me, what does Flex Wheeler take? What did Kevin Lavroni take? I've never been curious what one of my athletes that I've competed against has took because they don't know what I took. And it's none of their business. All they need to know is that when I show up on game day, they got to beat me or I got to or I got to beat them. And that gives my that frees my mind up for me to always stay focused on Sean Ray. 
So when people say Sean's always about Sean, everyone is about themselves in this industry. You have from to. beginning from beginning to, from beginning to end. It's, it is selfish, but I wouldn't be here if I wasn't selfish. You have to. I mean, even in business, I mean, um, success is a lonely road. Uh, and and if you're sustainably successful, like a person like yourself, that's you know that's that's still socially relevant. I mean, it is going to be a lonely road. I mean, um, just to give you an example, I mean, when I was on top of WFN, when I was on top of Iron Addicts, it's like I could probably count with like four fingers how many people I was constantly communicating with on a daily basis. Right. Um, everybody was my friend, <laughs> but in actuality, right. it's like the re- the, re- the harsh reality was that I was a paycheck to. Me. Uh, but the friends, court, you know, like you know that 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 I valued about four or five, and um, well, it's it, it's crazy because you know it's like I could it's like it's like I I, I earn a nine a ninety month sentence, all these people scatter like flies, and then I get out about a month and a half ago, about a month and a half ago, uh, I remember exactly like it was yesterday, obviously, um, June seventh, four four o'clock in the morning, I'm in the uh, Greyhound train um, bus station, um, six o'clock in the morning. I have a, I have a phone. Um, my I'm looking at the a slew of messages from you, from Kevin. I mean, the love. Just when they see me finally post a picture of my face hugging my mother, mm-hmm. dude. I had a I had to take a good two to three days, bro, um, because I couldn't keep my composure, dude. I fucking cried like a little girl because. Um, I thought that I was going to come out and, and like everybody was going to continue to to be dispersed. Like they were, you know, when it initially happened, man, I was like, you know, I was like, I now became a regular in RX muscle. Dave Palumbo showed me love. You showed me love. Kevin LeBron showed me love within like, within like two weeks, I was getting people wanting to invest in my concepts and my ideas, you know, like, you know, yeah. And I was just like, I was like, Holy shit. You know, God is fucking good, bro. Like I'm thinking to myself, how, how, how am I going to be able to bounce back financially because everybody's going to like isolate themselves from me. And it was the complete fucking opposite. I can count literally with two fingers, two people that I have changed their lives that were still the fucking pricks prior. And that, you know, and, 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 that, you know, and, and, and as soon as I got out, that's flex wheeler and micro sheep. Hence the reasons why I still have a little bit of bitterness for them, but it's no surprise because talking to you, talking to a lot of other people, like, you know, they, they have, sim- they share similar stories about these guys. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that um, it's not that you know who your friends are when everything's not going your way, because typically life goes on. It doesn't matter. You get sick, you're laid up. Nobody's trying to come to the hospital. You got to recover. You got to bounce back. You know, when you're bounced back, people are there waiting for you. Some of them. Um, when you go away, I, I got a lot of friends that have gone away and, and they come out and they got to kind of rebuild their lives. But you know what? It's a, it's a lonely journey. When I started bodybuilding, it's like going away to law school. It's like going away to the military. I This isn't a sport where I could carry five or six of my friends into. No. Bodybuilding for me, it's a, I've always talked about the journey because it's one of the most loneliest places and one of the selfish, place, selfish places you can go because not everybody understands it. You know, if you, if you decided to become a lawyer tomorrow, you've got to immerse yourself in books in isolation and it's what you want to do for you. So you can't bring five or six of your friends and go, hey, you guys, let's all go, let's all go become lawyers. No, it's your passion coming from within. When I decided to become a bodybuilder and I wanted to go to the gym twice a day and I wanted to go to Gold's Gym, which is an hour's drive away, and I wanted to go to other gyms, that was what was making me happy. And I couldn't drag my friends along with me. But when I got to the top, naturally, my friends looked around and they go, when the hell did this happen? When did you get all big? When I saw you in a magazine, what what were you taking? How did you get this way? They didn't see the time I went away yeah. to re yeah. to reinvent myself. You went away. It's time away from the real world, and it's an isolated time for reflection. Your friends couldn't be there for you. Your friends can't come in there and 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 sympathize with the isolation and the loneliness. You have a greater and fonder appreciation now that you're out, and the people that you treated well, they should be there for you. The people that know who you are as a, as a man, they'll be there for you, but not everybody knows you're out. So you can't, you, you have to, you've done it once, you can do it again. You can, you, you, you had it all and, and it took it all away. Look at Mike Tyson, he had it all and it all went away. 
And Mike Tyson has it all now and more. He said the best three years of his life. He's my age, 56 years old. The best three years of his life. He just posted it on his Instagram. Yeah, it was when he was in prison. Was when he was in prison. He said, you know what? The biggest, the, you have to be careful what you ask for. He said he, he wanted it all and God gave it all to him. And he took it away. And he said that was the best thing that could have ever happened to him because now he has a better appreciation for the finer thing, for the smaller things, for the family, for the friends, for the, for the respect, for the art of bodybuilding. Um, and sometimes you have to have it all taken away. Listen, for me, my entire dream was becoming Mr. Olympia. Maybe for me, that was the best thing to never happen for me. God's plan wasn't for me to be Mr. Olympia behind Dorian, behind Ronnie, and behind, behind uh, uh, Lee Haney. Arguably the greatest three Mr. Olympias in the history. Me becoming Mr. Olympia might have been too much for me to handle. It might have been too much too soon. I was, when I was getting second place, I was like 27, 28 years old. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't ready. I don't, I don't know, but it didn't happen. But I have a fonder appreciation for what the Mr. Olympia title is because I never actually got it. And I went through this entire sport alone. And so I had to create my family. I made my own family. I know who my friends are. I know who loves me. I know who doesn't. The superficial people, the transparency, it, it came out. You know, They're there for you in the high times and they're gone on the low times. I think for you, you got a better appreciation right now, better lens that you're looking through to see who people really are. And you also learn some good lessons in that isolation. It's a hard lesson. I would never want to lose my freedom for 90 months. But to hear Mike, Mike Tyson say three years in prison were the best thing that could happen in his life. And we know he's had everything. Uh, it was yeah. pretty profound. And I think your best years are ahead of you. And I understand it. I can relate to what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's crazy you said that and you brought Mike Tyson up because uh, it was a lot like me too. It's like, you know, when I've been interviewed um, and, they, you know, they tell me, it's like, hey, you know, it's like, what do you tell me about prison? I was like, I was like, it was a blessing in disguise. For me, it was a blessing in disguise because I was naive. I was ignorant. I thought like, you know, it's like I was in the drug game and I was in the bodybuilding game and I was in the, you know, at, at, where, where people were just look, would look just up, would look up to you as a paycheck. Like, honestly, thinking that everybody that was around me, like, I, I wanted to treat them like brothers. I wanted to treat them like friends. So, like, I, like, you know, when, when I was working with you, when I was working with Kevin, when I was working with all these other people, it was like, I did not just want to look at you as, you know, as a paycheck. I would text you, hey, how's your daughter doing, man? It's like, let's hang out for dinner. It's like, I was that kind of guy because yeah. I genuinely wanted to, you know, for the person to look at me as, as somebody that they could, could confine in. So when, so when the situation happened, I was like, holy crap. And then Jerry Ward, phenomenal guy, man. Like, you know, like posts a video when he sees the first video all out of prison, probably like, was still having that bitterness. You know, it's like, Jerry was like, Rich, um, I'm gonna tell you something. I think that the reasons why you have this bitterness and all that stuff is because you didn't know the industry. You yeah. know, you're a person that had nothing but corporate um, experience you know, like from an Ivy League school, working for someone else. And then all of a sudden you come in here, you blow the fuck up. You know, you do, you know, you, you have a thriving gym franchise. You have this thriving freaking clinic. And you thinking that it's like the people that are your friends, well, you know, are technically people that you could find and on the, on the necessary, on the complete opposite. And right. I love it because now, dude, um, like my circle is probably like three people, dude. And that's like my son. <laughs> my ex-wife yeah and, and and my mother bro like yeah. and, and 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 why because when i couldn't do anything in prison my mom figured out a way to pay, put money in for commissary man like my yeah. mother with her social security dude and mind you that was a person that was making over sixty thousand dollars a day and had yeah. probably putting like you know like a hundred dollars you know a month you know in commissary you know things like that dude it's like you know, really humble you. And, it, and, and, and it's funny you spoke about Mike Tyson because Mike Tyson had another video not too long ago when he was saying is like, there's so much power in humbleness because yes. the, it humbled me, dude. It humbled me a lot because I thought that I was, I was untouchable, dude. I thought I was untouchable. And I, because I was like, oh, you know what? To compensate for, for me thinking that I was untouchable, I'm helping all these people out. Man, that's bullshit. When I saw that, when I saw that indictment and I saw, you know, and I saw all these people that were willing to take the stand, ready to cooperate against me. And I saw some of those names and I'm like, fuck, I changed those people's lives. And those are the individuals. If I do decide 
to go to trial that are going to cooperate against me? Dude, I was depressed. I was depressed. Yeah. It's like, like, um, and if it wasn't for some close friends that I, you know, that I, that I built and, you know, relationships with in prison, we probably wouldn't be talking today because it really hit me, dude. It really hit me to the standpoint where I was even contemplating a suicide, man, because yeah. you get to that point and you're like, shit, I help these people, you know, come out of the gutter, come out of the hood. And, and like, and, and, and I mean, to this day, some of those individuals, like, are still faking it. <laughs> oh, no, no, listen. I mean, this is a sport uh, that I decided to be a part of where some of my best friends turn against me. You know, they, they talk shit about me, um, whether it's behind my back, whether it's about my physique or about my business. I mean, it's a very cutthroat business. I mean, bodybuilding, the real estate in bodybuilding is probably like that. In acting, it's probably the same in, in modeling everybody's fighting for the same real estate and you don't know who is who, but I'll tell you what I did learn is that to whom much is given much is expected and much is required. And, and the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I have to constantly as a reporter report on these bodybuilders that I knew dying and not everybody likes to hear the delivery speech of, I told you so. I mean, some of these guys that die, we can see it coming. We see the train on the tracks and we know that if they continue doing what they're doing, it's going to lead to death. And then when it actually crashes and burns and they die and then you pop up and you go, are we surprised? Um, people don't like to hear that. Oh, you have no compassion. Oh, you, you know, he's a father or he's a, he's a son. He's a husband. He's a, no, the problem is, is that where were you guys telling him to slow down? And, and, and back up off the things that he's doing. We can all see that the guy's fast tracking his way into the ground and no one is trying to stop this train wreck. And then the train wreck happens. And then here, here's me, I pop up going, none of you, this is a cautionary tale. How many bodybuilders have to die before somebody goes, you know what? I'm not gonna let my athlete take this. I'm not gonna let my friend go down this road. I'm not gonna let you do this to yourself. Well, I'm a reporter. And I sometimes get an inside look at what some of these guys are doing and they're not willing to hear me say, slow down. They're not willing to hear me say, take your time. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And then the body starts to, the body counts start to add up. That's the side of the sport that I don't like being the reporter, the bearer of bad news of people that I can clearly see coming out of the gate, that they're on the fast track to a train wreck and possibly dying. And then when you put it out there verbally, Dude, the cancel culture is real. I experienced it a year ago. These guys didn't want to hear me talking about one of the beloved bodybuilders that went that passed. And everyone and their mother could predict this. It was easy to predict that this guy's doing things that are going to put him in the ground. And there he, there he is. So not to have a holier-than-thou perspective, but when I was coming up, I didn't see bodybuilders dying. I didn't experience it. Maybe one or two. But now we see it every other month that some bodybuilders dying. And nine times out of ten, they're preventable deaths, they're drug-related deaths, and a lot of them are, 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 are wrapped around heart attacks and premature under the age of 55. So I'm feeling my mortality at the age of 56. I know that I'm on the back nine. I want every one of my friends, one of my, all of my athletes, all of my colleagues, I want them all to make it into old age and become grandfathers, uh, you know, and, and, and stop training and start exercising so they don't hurt themselves along the way. But it's hard to stop today's bodybuilders from killing themselves because they're trying to listen to the wrong guru or because they're trying to take too much drugs. And, and it's a sad state that we're in. And there's probably going to be some more commentary about bodybuilders dying. I, I just It's such unfamiliar territory for me to continue having these reports. And they don't like me being the bearer of bad news. So it's tough. Yeah, I, I agree 100% because, uh, I mean, some of the individuals that have passed away, um, uh, you know, I had close relationships with Cedric, phenomenal guy. Um, Cedric McMillan was a phenomenal guy. You have um, Dallas McCarver, another humble um, human being out of Florida, like you know that I, you know that I, uh, that I used to work with. I mean, and when you see these people just like at that young age, you know, um, and what what used to what used to frustrate me too is that at my peak when I was coaching all these athletes and stuff like that, and a person would come to me and be like, oh well. You know, like Kevin LeBron is probably taking X amount of, uh, of, of, of of things, and then I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to reveal what he is taking or what I uh, or what I prescribe to him. However, I'm kind of curious of what your athletes um, are doing. Boom, they're showing me these protocols, and I'm looking at these individuals. I'm like, 
fuck? It's like, this is not sustainable. Scary. And I was like, I was like, 20 IUs? Like, <laughs> I was like, in large hearts? It's like, all I think is like in large hearts, it's like large organs. It's like, you do this for like four or five years. It's like, you know, wonder yeah. people's lives are short lived. You know, yeah. um, you know, whereas like, you know, whereas like you still perfectly healthy, Kevin LeBron still perfectly healthy. I mean, I remember when, when, when Kevin LeBron announced himself to coming out of retirement, the first phone call I got in the Pittsburgh pro was from Ronnie Coleman. And this is Ronnie Coleman, like two weeks after hip surgery. Yeah. Telling me, he's like, Hey man, I think, I think you could get me back at the Olympia stage. I was like, man, didn't you not just have fucking hip surgery, man? What the yeah. fuck is wrong with you? And, not the real world. And it's like Rodney Coleman, phenomenal guy. I still talk to him till this day. But it's 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 just crazy that mentality and this mindset. I was like, yo, dude, just just let it go. Like, you know, get to that. Yeah. Point. So so to tell you where I'm at today, Rich. Some people ask, um, what am I doing? Again, I exercise. I don't train. Um, I walk. I don't run. Uh, I, I ride bikes. Um, I stretch. Uh, I move things around. I want to loosen up the joints. I want to keep my lower back fresh. I want to stretch my hamstrings out. I want to have, I want to be limber. Uh, you see Dorian Yates doing yoga. Um, there's a reason I don't train and it's because it's dangerous at my age. Training is dangerous. Not to mention I've done it since I was 17 years old. So do I want to continue doing the same thing I did at 57 that I was doing? at 17, 27, 37, 47 years old. I don't, I'm really not interested in it. So I think you have to find self-worth in being comfortable in your own skin. It's like being a, a high fashion model in your twenties. I'm not really interested in watching that same model in her fifties, trying to model like she's a 20 something year old. Unless, unless, unless she's JLo or somebody that still looks so <laughs> fucking high in their fifties. I mean, listen, we, uh, we, have the, we have the master's division for a reason. A lot of guys in their youth, are building businesses, they're raising children, uh, they're in college or in school or whatever. And so at 40 years old, they have the finances and the time to actually invest in bodybuilding and they want to find out what they look like in the master's division. Okay, so I don't want to take anything away from them. But I started out as a teenager. I don't have the same interest as a teenager that I do at 56 years old as a grandfather. I'm not really, you know, trying to squat three plates and bench 400 pounds. It's, it's only a recipe for disaster and it's an injury waiting to happen for me. That's me personally. So what do I do? I modify that. I exercise, I stretch, uh, I, I ride the bikes outdoors. Instead of walking on the treadmill inside, I walk at the beach. Um, instead of uh, riding a stationary bike for 45 minutes, staring at the wall, I'll get on a bicycle and I'll ride outdoors on trails. Uh, I'll golf. I'm not a good golfer, but I'm out, I'm out on the course, right? I jump in the swimming pool and I actually swim. I go out here and I jump in the ocean and I swim. There are things you can do I, that, I, that I never did because I was bodybuilding. All my energies went to bodybuilding. I bowl. Uh, I play table tennis. Um, so you have to find that diversification to, to burn those calories and to use your body in ways other than breaking it down because weight training breaks down the body. And that's why you have to eat all these meals to build it back up. Well, I don't want to keep breaking down my body. I'm 56. I don't want to break my body down. I, I, I take my foot off the gas. I don't want to go in and train because here's what I'm seeing when I watch through the internet. I'm seeing Rich Kaspari just having neck surgery on an old injury he had when he was bodybuilding. I'm seeing Ronnie Coleman having surgery on his hips and his back from some bodybuilding related stuff. I'm watching Flex Wheeler having surgery on his shoulder right now. Uh, you know, my, my good friend, Dave Lieberman, just had hip surgery because he fell he broke, broke his femur um there are things at my age that can happen if you don't double check the level of intensity that you're trying to work out i don't want to work out i just want to exercise i can't get hurt exercising so you really do have to dumb it down and i've dumbed it down to the degree that if i get hurt it's not going to be because i'm trying to build my body up or is i know I know in my head, when I go to the gym, I'm breaking my body down. I don't want to break my body down. I want to loosen it up. I want to stretch it out. I want to be limber. I want to be flexible. I don't want to have the back injuries. I don't want the shoulder injuries, the neck injuries, the hip replacement. We've seen all of these things with bodybuilders that continue to bodybuild well in their 50s when they need to find a new hobby. It's not that hard. I was in the gym today. I did some really light biceps. 
I did 15 pound curls, 15 pounds. I did 15 pounds. <laughs> I did 15, 15 pound. Uh, you heard that uh, guys like Sean Ray doing 15 pound curls. Yeah. I'm that, I'm that guy. And guess what? I, I'm not going to be that guy going in for surgery anytime soon. Yeah. That's important to know. That's a, that's it's, it's crazy. You said that because that kind of mindset is also a mindset that um, as you grow and you mature um, can transition even in business. I mean, yeah. um, it's just like, um, like when I got out, you know, people were like, man, are you going to, are you going to be that guy with the 12 cars again? Are you going to be that guy with like, you know, with like all those condos and, and being on social media all the time and all that stuff. I'm yeah. going to no, be the guy that's going to have a phenomenal eight year old son. That's going to have a phenomenal trust. Uh, because now my priorities has changed. I've had that. I've had that lifestyle. And I've told people that it's like, hey, you know what? I had so much money. I had so many cars. I had so many women, so many things in my life, but I was miserable. And people right. were like, really? Like, really? And I was like, yes, I was miserable because I was filling a void. You see, now it's like, that's why I found prison to be a, a blessing because now I have my one car. I have my nice beachfront condo with a nice young um, Cuban girl, man, that, that could be my girlfriend. Uh, that's my girlfriend now. I'll be perfectly happy as long as I know that I'm not that idiot that has that money for that yacht, but won't go ahead and purchase it. And know that right. my son, if at, 18, if at 18 years old, he wants to be a fucking dancer, he has a trust that will help him, you know, path, you know, you know, you know, you know, like carve that path so be it. I'll be perfectly happy. And I know that if God, you know, you know, tells me to go home, um, you know, um, he sends me to heaven and, and I, and my son's trust is, you know, my son's trust is set. I'll be happy. I mean, I've had so many people come to me, you know, when I got out as a, like, Hey man, I'll give you a half a million dollars. Let's launch another clinic. Let's do this. And I was like, kind of like, there's no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. I was like, I, like, I have a plan. It's like, I want my supplement line. I want to be involved in a partnership with a clinic that I know is completely 100% above board. I, and, and, you know, that I can sleep at night knowing that I'm not going to have to tell my son once again that I will have to leave you for another five years. Yeah, sometimes, I mean, listen, life's lessons can smack us hard in the face. Sometimes it's better to get that slap early because it prepares you for the second half. The back nine is what I call it. Yeah. I'm on the back nine. You know, I'm on the back nine. I got a 14-year-old. I have a soon-to-be 17-year-old. And... Um, the things that used to entertain me as a bodybuilder, the things that used to interest me as a bodybuilder, the, the taste, they change, the priorities, they change, the, the things that are going to make me happy, they change. And so for me, my passion isn't how I look. My passion isn't how much money I make or what kind of cars I drive. It's how many other people I can help. And I think if you're helping other people, you're actually helping yourself and you'll always be relevant. You'll, you'll always be relevant you'll always be a needed you'll always be an asset to people in need and so i'm trying to as i elevate bring people with me and bring the young people the next generation with me and tell the stories that i've learned along the way so that they don't make those same mistakes which is why i'm so heavily invested in these young guys being careful with their health taking more uh, interest in just building their physique, learning their physiques instead of turning it all over to a guru um, and a coach. You've got to get in there and you got to, you know, as a cook, you got to get in there and, and try to cook the food and burn it up sometimes until you can get it right before you, before you have someone else tell you how to do things. The yeah, bodybuilders yeah. today, they don't want to learn their bodies first. What they want is they want someone to tell them how to do everything. And then they tell them when to compete and they tell them where they're going to compete. And then they have no control over their career. I'm, I'm from the old school. I, I, I knew where I wanted to go and I mapped it out and I slowly and gradually pursued it. So I'm not a rocket science. This guy, anybody can do what I did, but it has to come from the passion within. And if you have the passion, you'll get the longevity. 100%. Uh, and I want to end it by saying um, thank you so, so much, uh, Sean. Um, it's like, you know, for being, uh, for being there for me now, for being there for me uh, before. Um, and for being uh, the person that you are in the industry, no nonsense, speaking the truth, even if it hurts, you know, because um, we need we need that we need that honesty in the uh, in, in this in this industry because because people like us are far and few. Again, thank you so much for your time, and I definitely look forward to having you uh, uh, again on this podcast. But most importantly, like staying in touch, man, staying in touch. Absolutely, man. Well, welcome back to the real world. We'll see you soon. All right, take care, brother. All right, you got it, my man. Appreciate you.
Looking for your fountain of youth? Circadian Rejuvenation Med Spa is Charlotte's luxurious one-stop med spa. We offer microneedling, hydra and laser facials, laser hair, scar, and vein removal, cryo skin treatments, medical weight loss solutions, and much more. Visit us online today at circadianrejuvenation.com and give yourself the gift of looking and feeling your best. Book your free consultation today at Circadian Rejuvenation Med Spa. It's not just a service, it's an experience. 